Becoming a hireable web developer in six months is no easy feat, but it can be done. I'm a self-taught developer, by the way, and it took me about two years because I learned a little bit of this, a little bit of that, took some breaks, and I had no idea really what skills employers were looking for. We are a few years down the road now, and I have a really good idea about what I would learn in what order if I were to start from scratch and try to become a hireable web developer in six months. In this video, I'm going to impart what I wish I knew to you. We will look at the most important skills to learn and in what order, whilst also considering what you need to do to stand out and actually get a job as a self-taught web developer without a degree. If you can think about this throughout the process, it will accelerate everything. Along the way, I don't think I'm going to be able to help myself from sprinkling in a few top tips here and there, because let me be clear, becoming a web developer in just six months is a pretty hefty goal. You're going to need a good study program, and I hope you'll get that from this video. You're going to need a good course or curriculum or website that works for you, but you're also going to need a strong mentality to show up almost every day and really make progress as to what you're learning. This is something I didn't really understand at the beginning and I wish I had help with on day zero. So in this video, I'm going to try and share some of what I wish I knew with you. Let's get into it. Before jumping into the specific technical skills you should learn, let's look at the first top tip. Give yourself permission to be bad. No one likes to be bad at something, but we all start somewhere. I think you should lean into it and accept that you won't be the best to begin with, but you should also understand that you will build momentum towards the tail end of these six months. If you resist this fact and get frustrated and rush and skip steps, you will feel like you're making progress in the beginning, but it's surely going to take you longer when you have to go back and fill in gaps in your knowledge to learn more intermediate and advanced concepts. With that in mind, let's look at specifically what you should learn first. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. HTML is a special text file format that allows you to define what content you want on your web page. For example, a heading and some text. CSS enables you to style that content, for example, by making the title red and bold. With the right course, learning HTML and CSS should be really, really fun. I think as long as you have a good teacher and like curriculum you get on with, you'll start to build nice, maybe even kind of useful websites to life that you can actually share with your friends much sooner than you might anticipate. One of the most rewarding things about web development is like seeing the stuff you work on come to life gradually. And then, yeah, you get to share it with people. I'm really excited for you to experience that. Moreover, you'll start to feel a bit more comfortable working in these special text file formats as actually working with text in these text file formats is the basis for all of modern web development. Once you've got some content on the page and you've made it pretty with CSS, you might want to start looking at how to make your website interactive using another special text file format, technically known as a programming language called JavaScript. JavaScript enables you to detect when events happen on your page, like when a button is pressed, for example, and then run a series of logical instructions as a result. So for example, if you want to add a you know, purchase button and maybe that adds the item to a shopping cart, that's something you would achieve with JavaScript. Now in 2022, it is more important than ever the, the websites you view on your desktop or laptop can also be read and interacted with properly on a mobile device. So look at a website like BBC News on your computer, for example. If you load that same website on your phone, it's going to present the exact same information and pictures and give you all the same features. However, it's in a much more condensed format that makes better use of the available screen space. Instead of building like one website for each device or width of screen, essentially, modern websites respond to the size of the screen and shuffle and resize the elements on the page accordingly. To achieve this, you need to structure your website and the HTML in a certain way and then as web developers, we normally rely on a feature of CSS called media queries to adjust the styling, positioning, and sizing of things depending on the size of the monitor. 
Okay, time for another top tip, which is to join a community. See, I love learning about new developers' success stories. That's one reason I host the Scrimba podcast and speak with so many new developers. But I also like to watch YouTube videos. And I came across this YouTuber named Thomas who became a developer in six months. So that's inspiring. We know it can be done. And he talks about how he was so grateful to have found friends early on in the process as they provided him with context and advice and caveats that he just, in his words, could not get from like a Udemy course or something. I agree completely. I think it's so important you meet other developers, talk about your challenges and the things you've learned. And if you don't know any developers in real life, you don't need to worry. In recent years, Discord and Twitter communities around new developers have really blossomed and they're available to everybody. You'll be super welcome there and you might even feel like you're back on the school playing field. Uh, it's so easy to make friends when you're all on the same path, essentially. All right, what should you learn next? I reckon some next level JavaScript. The foundations of JavaScript can take you a pretty long way, but if you want to become a hireable web developer, it would certainly help you to know some more intermediate JavaScript concepts. You might be kind of surprised to know that the first version of JavaScript was released in 1995, 26 odd years ago. And while a lot of the fundamentals are the same and are still used today, there have of course been updates to the language and it might serve you well to learn some of those new features. Not only are they going to help you write better JavaScript code and understand other code bases that use these features, but they can give you an advantage when you learn additional JavaScript tools and libraries like React.js, which is something I'll talk about in an upcoming section. Here are some examples of next level or intermediate JavaScript features to look out for. But of course, you don't need to worry about learning those today. Oh, I remember my first acronym. There are many to learn in the world of web development. In fact, HTML is an acronym, but there are arguably no acronyms more important than API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. That means absolutely nothing to you? Fair enough, I get it. I was probably exactly the same. In the simplest terms, an API is provided by a company and you can use that API in your JavaScript code to interact with that company's database or features. For example, Todoist, which is a to-do app, has an API. As a JavaScript developer, you could authenticate your users' Todoist accounts, so you, you know, log in and know it's them. And then you can almost like take actions on their behalf using JavaScript code, like adding or striking a to-do list item. This way you could build an integration, right? So that your web app is connected with Todoist somehow. Now that's a quite commercial example, right? Maybe you're not going to add a to-do list integration, but there are actually many APIs built specifically for front-end web developers. For example, there are APIs like Superbase, which allow you to set up and provision the database. And then you can call the Superbase API from your JavaScript code to store user data in a database without the need for you yourself to learn about backend developments, which is a completely different specialization. In fact, I've made an entire video linked up here about the differences between front and web development, which is what we're talking about today, and backend server-side development in case you want to check it out. Working with APIs is certainly tricky, but it is unavoidable and a very important skill for you to develop. It also introduces some challenges in your JavaScript code, which are normally solved using an intermediate JavaScript feature called asynchronous functions. Around this time, you know, we're getting a few months into things, maybe your motivation is starting to dwindle, which is why I highly recommend that you top your inspiration up weekly by either joining a community or server with a bunch of inspiring members, or maybe listening to a podcast or something like that. In the case of like Discord servers at Scrimba, we actually have this channel called I Got Hired, where South Tor aspiring web developers, maybe just a few months ahead of you by this point, post when they find success, whether that's their first new developer job or something else. And it's super motivating to see that people on the same path are finding success. You just need to, you know, stick to it essentially. Moving on, let's talk about Flexbox and Grid. 
Flexbox and Grid are intermediate CSS features that enable you to position elements on your web page, like maybe putting two sections next to each other, or even positioning a navigation in some cases. These intermediate technologies allow you to do that in such a way that your website can be adapted to be responsive more easily. The funny thing is, like when you learned about responsive web design earlier in this journey, you almost certainly came across Flexbox, Grid, or both. I'm suggesting that you really master those technologies at this point, since they are crucial when taking an existing design, maybe in Figma, for example, and then converting it into a real life website. This is a specific task that is asked of many new developers. And so if you can learn and really grok those skills, you will be desirable and attractive to any company that needs to convert designs into real websites, which uh, last time I checked is all of them. Git is good to learn. It's time you get good at Git. What is Git? Well, have you ever like worked on a essay in a Word document and then accidentally deleted the Word file or you lost your USB drive or something? Maybe you deleted a section in the Word file because you thought you didn't need it, only to kind of regret it thinking, oh, I'd like to reference that. Maybe you've come across a scenario where you and like a fellow student or coworker or friend or whoever want to work on the same document together, but you're kind of anxious about writing over each other's changes or duplicating work. Since all coding happens in like this text file format, you can suffer from many of the same problems, yet probably you don't want to collaborate on a Word document. You certainly need to and want to collaborate on software. This is where Git comes in. Git is a specialized tool designed to track changes in your code files and coordinate work among a team of developers. Git is a type of tool known as a source control tool, and there are a few to pick from, but honestly, by now in 2022, most companies use Git. And therefore, if you can learn it, you'll be able to hit the ground running when you join a company. Not only that, but as a new web developer, learning Git also unlocks you the ability to collaborate with study buddies or friends and maybe even contribute to open source. As promised, let's talk about React, which is a web development library. A web development library is essentially pre-written code modules that you can like import into your web applications and be more productive since you don't have to like write everything yourself. When you set out to build a website, you could build everything yourself but sometimes there are common features that are used in every app that it would make more sense to use a pre-written code module for. And that's where React comes in really, and the reason why it's so popular among professional teams and a great technology to learn if your goal is to become a hireable web developer in six months. Nobody will expect a junior web developer to be a React mastermind, but I think you should learn some advanced React features especially as a byproduct of building more ambitious projects. Here are some advanced React features to look out for. If you can incorporate one or some or all of these features into a sort of showcase project, I think that's a great signal that you've built something that is going to stand out, impress employers and give them plenty of questions so you can start like a dialogue in an interview. Speaking of interviews, I think you should apply to jobs before you feel ready. It's hard to answer the question, how do I know if I'm ready to apply for developer jobs? Maybe you pick a milestone, like after you complete a bootcamp or a course or something. Maybe you put a timer on it, like six months. But generally speaking, most people, not just developers, but people, we kind of suck at measuring our own ability and might even doubt ourselves and have some degree of imposter syndrome. You have to understand that not all entry-level jobs are made equal. Many companies are willing to hire new developers that show potential and train them up. And then for you, this means you get to learn while you earn, which to me is a dream scenario. That's actually what Anne-Marie did, a successful Scrimba student I interviewed on the Scrimba podcast. She started applying to jobs with just four months of experience and was shocked when she actually got a job and the opportunity to start learning while she earns. In her case, the company really appreciated her soft skills and ambition and ability to take feedback. It's not all just about your raw coding output, folks. And that's something you'll have to sort of wrap your head around as you as you get to the end of this journey. I will link the full interview with Anne-Marie in case you want to check it out in the description. 
If you know some next level JavaScript and you have a solid understanding of Flexbox and Grid and stuff, I think you're in a very good place to start applying for jobs. Don't get caught unprepared. Make sure you have a resume that is well made, ready to go in case an opportunity that you find exciting presents itself. It's hard to shake this image that being a successful dev is all about having like the most amazing dev skills. Like obviously it matters, but if nobody knows or can quickly understand how awesome you are, why are they gonna get in touch and sort of offer you a job? Like you really have to surface your ability. You really have to make it clear in your resume. That is why it's important you set out a very clear and compelling resume that gives your future employer a sense of where you've been and where you want to go. Only then can you stand out in a stack of resumes. Now, I'm not going to diverge too much and talk about resumes, but my awesome coworker Leanne has done some resume review sessions with an actual tech recruiter where they talk all about the do's and don'ts and things. So you can check that out right here if you want to as well. Much like a resume, a portfolio can help you, a web developer without a degree, stand out. On your website, you get to talk about yourself in the way that's most favorable, and you get to show off your best work. Did you know, by the way, that most developers don't have a portfolio? And just by creating one, you essentially stand out. Even if it's quite basic to begin with, you can always iterate and improve on it later. I've known students at Scrimba who have released something they're not super proud of and you know plan to come back and improve it and showcase their skills, but they got hired before they got the chance and got busy. I think that's a very good problem to have. If you're interested, we have some videos on the Scrimba channel about how to build an awesome portfolio. And I'm also linking for posterity a couple of portfolios of developers that were hired in the last year or so. But that's all really for this video. I think it's about time we wrap up. So here are all the skills you should learn. And here are a few of my top tips all in one place. It's recommended that you learn these skills in this order because they each lay the foundation for the next skill or technology, right? And you definitely want to avoid that trap of like getting too excited about a particular technology and skipping the fundamentals because you will just have to go back to the beginning. The other thing about this list and the way it's structured is that it builds a very important foundational knowledge. Like if you try and learn React without first understanding next level JavaScript, you're going to get frustrated and it's going to be super annoying. I would just follow this list and do it right the first time. Six months is an ambitious time to become a self-taught web developer, but we know it can be done. We surveyed more than 25 successful self-taught junior developers who learned on Scrimba on our podcast, the Scrimba podcast. Every time I would sort of ask people, how long did it take you? And so the kind of average answer is like, you know, six to nine months you know, six months is on the more aggressive side and, you know, there will always be outliers. The most important thing you realize is that everyone is a little bit different, both in terms of what they know already, you know, maybe they have some IT related experience that gives them an advantage or, or they've done some problem solving work before that gives them an advantage. Also, it's about your environments, right? Like when we say six to nine months, that kind of assumes two or three hours a day, which, you know, maybe sounds like part time, but, you know, if you've done a job already that day or you have family obligations, you're not going to be fresh and have the right energy to truly internalize what you're learning. So this is, you know, two or three hours a day full time for six to nine months. If you can only do things part time, then I have you know much respect to you for that grind, by the way, but you might want to sort of adjust your timeline accordingly. It could take twice as long, right? Depending on everything else that's going on. And it's very important in all these cases, you do not compare yourself to others because you know we're all different and it's really hard looking at someone else to know exactly uh, what they're going through. And it just stands to like demotivate you basically. So don't do that. Wow, we really are getting into the things I wish I knew. I definitely struggled with that, but I hope that based on my experiences and the things I've learned interviewing people on the Scrimba podcast, this sort of study plan will help you at least get started. And if you're looking for specific courses to support any of these subjects, then definitely check out Scrimba link in the show notes. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Alex Booker. I will see you next time. Do remember to like the video, subscribe, and in just a second, you can pick from a couple of other videos that I mentioned in the video in case you're chilling and you just want to watch something else and, you know, learn more about web development.